Yeah, like they've they're creeping. They're creeping, but they they're on another. They can oh, they can they do, can do it. whatever you know how they want. I feel like they can. Sure, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> that album's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> they might have a forty-five on Karma Chief coming up. You, who? I, I don't know. If we didn't hear that. It was in might, his, it was in his glass, but uh, they some, might. I don't know. Man, who knows? Possibly. Wild. Hey everybody, welcome to Fretboard TV, episode 14. I'm here with Plaid Room and Coal Mine Records founder Terry Cole. They're out of Loveland, Ohio. So about a year ago, man, I was on Spotify and Neil Francis, who's one of your artists, came up uh -huh. on uh, release Radar. Hadn't heard of him before, super stoked to hear the song. It was Changes, it yep. just come out. I was like, man, this song's awesome. Who's this guy signed to? And I realized it was Karma Chief and I had no idea what Karma Chief was. And so I, I dig a little deeper. It says Loveland, Ohio. So I sent an email. I, I figure out that that Karma Chief is associated with Coal Mine. Yep. And that's Plaid Room. And it blew my mind that you guys were right around the corner because I was not familiar. Yeah. So immediately sent an email. The same night. I think it was a Saturday or Sunday night. <laughs> and I was just trying to figure out ways to work with you guys. It eventually led to our two-year anniversary, which was in November yep. um, of last year. And... We got Neil out here, and we got GA20, which is a blues act on Karma Chief as well. Yep. And uh, the rest is history. Yeah, we it was were a fun uh, night. Yeah, it was an awesome night. Yeah, and so we had we had some other things planned, you know, hope hope to do this year, and uh, then COVID hit and kind of wiped all that stuff out. But uh, we're excited to have you here. Yeah, this, yeah thanks for having us. Really we appreciate cool. it. Yeah, man. always appreciate all the support. Absolutely, so it's wonderful. Yeah. So uh, we won't dive too deeply into your history. Uh, all that stuff is on your website. You should go to coalminerecords.com. Check it out. Go to the About page. You'll find out all the history and the funny stories about how Coal Mine came to be. Also, City Beat had a pretty awesome write-up on Terry. And, yeah, uh, yeah, Mike did a great job. Yeah. He did it better than anybody. Oh, it was amazing. Anybody could have, yeah. probably. So. I don't even think this interview is going to be any better than that. It's just, <laughs> it's just a visual thing, which is, you know, makes I it read, a little bit. When I read Mike's piece, I was like, oh, man, that's what happened. <laughs> cool. It was it was pretty epic. That came out like the same week that I reached yeah, out to you yeah. guys. And I was like, oh man, this is crazy timing because <laughs> I'm, I felt like I was discovering something that I definitely wasn't discovering. It wasn't like, I, but when City B put it out, I was like, oh man, like I, I got to really jump on this <laughs> before someone else does from a brewery standpoint. Um, but yeah, like real quick, I mean, that the, the name and the, and the logo and all that stuff stemmed from a visit to Subway sandwich shop in oxford while you're in school yeah and yeah yeah i was in grad school and i just uh i decided that i was working with a, a band a, a hip-hop band we were playing with and i made this record with my buddy and i wanted to i wanted it to look legitimate so i thought i'd make up a record label and so coal mine was already taken like with a coal and i was like i'll oh, use yeah. my last name and i was just sitting in subway doodling I drew it on a napkin. I was like, oh, cool. There it is. <laughs> so you basically got Bob, your brother, uh -huh. to forego a career in computer engineering. For sure. In yeah. order to uh, run shop with you. Yeah, yeah. So what is uh, what, are the, what are the differences in your roles, you know, in, in regards to you two well, managing things? I, I think uh, five years ago, it was, when we first opened, it was, we'll all do everything all the time. And we just both did everything. Yeah. And as things have gotten busier in the companies, both sides have grown, you know, I'm probably 90, 90 to 95% label and he's probably 90 to 95% shop. Mm -hmm. So the day to day for him looks like managing the store, managing our employees, okay. making sure the shipments are going out, that sort of thing. And then for me, I'm overseeing all of the labels projects, making sure everything's on time. Sure. Communicating with artists, managers, contracts, all that kind of stuff. And you guys just had a session on Saturday, you said? We did, yeah. Andrew Gabbard okay. and uh, from the, the Gabbard Brothers, yep. he came down and we just did like a little live session, got some photos. That's cool. It's nice. Yeah, it's super nice. The whole building is like a one-stop shop for the label. It's yeah. like people can browse, they can get their photos taken upstairs. Like Whitney, get, yeah. Yeah, yeah, your wife. Get, <laughs> yeah, they can get video. We shot video. We shot some some live audio. I mean, it's just it's, it's like, awesome how yeah. in in house everything is. Yeah, for it's sure. Not a huge operation, but it just feels it's an it's on a national level, right? Yeah, so yeah. It feels good, small but mighty. It is super cool. So, uh, you know, the roster of talent on Coal Mine spans everything. I mean, it's it's a soul driven label. 
Yeah. There's a lot of Afro beat. There's a lot of psych, uh, especially with the Karma Chief uh, yes. imprint. But your personal work, you kind of touched on it as a funk and hip hop producer. What were you guys listening to as kids growing up that kind of drove your in, your inspiration and, and your influence and stuff like um, that? I, I think we, as like really young kids, our dad would play like all kinds of 50s R&B and, and doo-wop. Um, and then as we, you know, you get to like middle school when you actually start I don't know, for a lot of me and a lot of my friends, that was when we actually like started to have opinions sure. about music. <laughs> and, you know, so we went through our classic rock phase and uh, and then got into hip hop. And then I got into jazz and soul. And I think Bob went through a lot of the same really? sort of phases. But we had an older brother who he was way into all kinds of different music. So he was sure. always like percolating things down like hey, you know, here's this really gnarly Bill Evans record. And I'm like, I don't know who that is. So <laughs> um, so he was like a sort of a mentor in that capacity. Okay. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it, but it's always sort of centered around like, R, you know, at, at the root of it, it's like R&B. The soulful stuff. Yeah. Not yeah, so sure. heavy rock driven or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, we all, there's all kinds of stuff in that world that we all love. Sure. But, um, I think R&B is like just the core of it. Yeah. And that's some very, I have a very similar upbringing and, and background as well and i kind of touched on it in my episode you know i appreciate the rock the heavier rock stuff but it's if it doesn't have that that awesome drum you know backbeat and yeah yeah that's kind of what i look for and how, how everything's driven um so we can continue to build on that then so as you guys approach new talent you know with the with the label mm -hmm. Um, how do you go about that? Are you discovering it through your own search or are you getting reached out by other agents or is it word of mouth from musicians yeah, who already established I'd say on it's, the label? It's, it's the latter for sure. Okay. Almost, almost always. Okay. It's very seldom that I'm actively reaching out sort of out of the blue, like a cold reach out or vice versa. But yep. that works. That almost never works. Right. Um, not to say like, don't send us anything, but I mean, we get... We get like 15 to 20 demo submissions a day. Oh, wow. And I, maybe like one out of any that I've ever been like, oh, yeah, this is on point. You know, this is on the money. Um, Can you talk about who that was? We, it's, still, it's still in the works oh, right okay. now. Wow. Um, so we'll see if it actually comes to fruition. But I think, I, I mean, I think, I think we get a lot because our email is public. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so right. it's easily to be like, oh, whatever at coalminerecords.com that made my job getting... <laughs> a lot easier though finding you guys yeah. as well so but i think uh most of the time it's like you know oh hey my buddy has this project he's working on yeah and i'll listen to him and be like this is great you know what do you want to do what's your goals and if they're in line then we'll start to work together yeah absolutely so what is that it or wow factor that you guys are looking for when you're bringing on talent? i think it's uh, like 90 percent uh just does the music resonate with us okay you know i think at the and I've tried to like communicate what that is because I really don't know. There's definitely a, a level of like authenticity mm -hmm. that I think is at the core of everything, no matter what the genre is or no matter who's doing it. I think that's kind of at the at the crux of everything is like this authentic level of of uh, sincerity with whatever we're doing. Yeah. So who is the longest tenured act on Coal Mine today? Uh, it can be Shakedown. You keep it Shakedown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That was like 2008. Wow. I think. Um, so where did that stem from? How did that relationship begin? MySpace. Really? MySpace. Okay. Where all good things start. MySpace. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think, so there was like two connections that happened. So Tom Brennick, who is uh, the guitarist for Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings and Charles Bradley and Lee Fields and Budos Band, um, he I did had, not realize that he was involved oh, in that yeah. many projects. He's he's ever he's That's everywhere. awesome. But he um he had just built a new studio in Brooklyn after the Men and Menahan Street Band. That, okay. And yeah. he had just produced that record, gotten a really big sample from Jay Z. Had, oh yeah. So had some money to build a new studio. Um, so he built this new studio in Brooklyn, and he was starting to track people like outside of himself. And he tracked an EP for me to be Shakedown, but he was getting ready to go on the road. He didn't really have a, like, it wasn't going to go on dab tone or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And I had talked to him when I was at Miami to get tracks from him to play on my radio show there. Right. So we had, like, had a very loose relationship, and he knew that I ran a label or had started a label. And so he was like, hey, 
I'll connect you guys. And I had already talked to, I think, Nadal, who's a trombone player on MySpace, maybe, too. Okay. So it was like, oh, cool. And that's how it started. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. You've done a wonderful job staying true to the brand and picking sounds, you know, kind of what we just talked about, having sure. that curated sound. Um, and it's, it's impressive. What's been the hardest part, though, managing a label with acts all across the country uh, when you're stationed in Loveland, Ohio? I think right, I, I think right now, or it made the last couple of years is just the volume of acts, the volume of projects, I guess. Okay. You know, whereas like five years ago or four years ago, even it was like, oh yeah, we'll release three LPs this year. Mm -hmm. And you know, we know that to make an LP is a certain number of hours for somebody and that's fine. But when it goes from three to like nine to 11, yeah. and then at the same time, the overall volume, the overall reach and the pressure is increasing. It just, that, that's that been the hardest thing. I think the, the geography- too, probably, yeah, right? Yeah, everything. You that yeah. much more, you have to try to promote with a small team. Yeah, because it's always, we always want to do better too. So you're right. like, oh, how many of you doing that one? Like, oh, man, I feel like we could ramp it up. Right, I feel right. like we can really push out into this space and try to get these sorts of fans. So I think that's geography because of the internet. Geography almost feels like yeah, nullified, right. but- the, just the workload has dramatically yeah, adding the resources. Yeah, gotcha. So conversely, what's been the most rewarding aspect of all of this, including running the shop? I think um, seeing bands go from, uh, you know, no one, theoretically, you know, uh, to having a successful tour and selling out of records and selling out shows, you know, those little steps all along the way, that's always the most rewarding thing, you know, like hearing that, a tour, their first tour out went really well. You know, like Duran's first tour, like we were all like, oh, I hope this goes well. Yeah. And, you know, it went really well. And it was just like constantly building, but seeing bands grow and seeing bands have a farther reach. And for the store too, I think having people come in the store and ask about artists that we represent, not knowing that we represent those artists. Yeah. Oh, that's wow. like the ultimate, hey, it worked. Like whatever we're doing, <laughs> it reached this person. And now yeah. they're walking in our store going, hey, do you have this? And we're like, you know, the, like we got like a thousand <laughs> of them. Um, or the only ones carrying the limited yeah, edition. Yeah, exactly. That, yeah. Like, that's, that's sort of like, that's your work being like coming back to you. Like you're seeing like, <laughs> hey, we did all these things. Right. And this person literally walked in the store. We, we made them walk in the store and ask about it. And that, that's a great feeling. Do people walk in not knowing that you're coal mine? Hunter, yeah. Really? Tons. But they, but like you just said, they're looking for coal mine artists, but they just. Uh, maybe, sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it's great when they, it doesn't matter. You know, to us, oh, it's totally. like, we use the store as like this marketing. I mean, when I'm downstairs, like, a difference between Bob and I is that like, I'm like, I'm like very salesman. Not, so do you, not you, like you a sleazy. play the coal mine artists on the, in oh, the store versus, yeah. but Bob will play other stuff. I, I might, I might, I don't think I'm like a sleazy salesman, but like I am constantly pushing that. I don't know, probably heavy handedly. You know, if I see somebody gaze at the coal mine wall. Oh yeah. And I'm like, I will ask, I will evoke, a, I will ask a question instead of leaving them alone. What is your question? What is the go-to? Oh, are like, are you asking like, genre style? If they like or? pick up one of the records and they look okay. at it, I'm like, oh, you know, that was made here, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then we like, oh, you know, all these were made here? All of these right here. These were all made. Yeah. We, we did all these. All those beautiful spines that align that's and right. look wonderful. All those yeah, great that, colors. That's, that's, yeah, so I'm, but I'm not downstairs very much anymore. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so you got to push Bob a little harder. Yeah, he's like Change Bob is ways. like king neutral. Yeah, he's the king of neutral, which is good. Which is really good because <laughs> it feels I'm, honest, right? When, he, when oh, you're it's like super, that. it's super honest. Right, right. Which it's it's like um, we did like an enneagram thing for all of us. And Bob, I think, is the loyalist. Okay, which is like you know uh, rooted in like integrity, rooted in the right thing all the time rooted in no exaggeration whereas <laughs> i tend i think i was like a three which is like the enthusiast or the achiever or something okay. so i'm just like yeah like, yeah let's like that's yeah, awesome though course, but that's it's the a good you need it's a good yeah right so i'll come in with a bunch of stupid ideas and he's like yeah those are all stupid so how's your approach to business shifted during covid and the pandemic i know that uh we had talked and you said your your sales and, and online have gone up or at least they did especially yeah, yeah, right yeah. in the beginning um so that first week it was the week we had released monophonics oh yeah and they were about to start a tour and yeah. we were like 
this which I have tickets to. <laughs> Sick. It's going to be an awesome show. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so it really took the wind out of the sails because we so we felt so good about that record and we put the band and everybody put so much time and effort into the rollout and it was just like like no yeah. you don't get to play any shows right um but you know the record did great so no matter it's fine but that first week we were like we closed on a monday and we were just kind of like i don't know what monday the do. like 15th or whatever that yeah, was yeah and we were just like well let's just see how this goes so we kind of went through that week looked at our sales and we're like all right we couldn't have staff so you know there was a little bit of money saved right. i guess but we were like all right we need to lean in online and we already were doing it in a pretty big way yeah but we were like we just need to do it better we just need to do it more we need to advertise and so we just ramped up and within like a week we were already doing we had already matched what our normal sales would be open oh wow and then it just kept going up yeah and then we were like kind of struggling to keep up you know because we didn't have staff again so but once we got our staff back um and we were able to catch up it was pretty amazing because now we're like man we wouldn't have had time to to put into growing it right if it wasn't for this oh absolutely. you know it's something that obviously the opportunity was always there but you know you're just trying to, to do it yeah you're just grinding away you know and you can't right you, you've got blinders on and so that's where this was birthed yeah this whole exactly. thing was just like we got the time we got to figure out ways to yeah. slowly reach people in different ways so. yeah and, and if you if you didn't have that time you're you never would have gone there because you're like i don't have time to do exactly that. right so um you know for us now that we're opening back up it's like everything is more yeah you know, which is great it's good for local customers good for online customers it's good for everybody all of our employees so it, it feels good yeah i mean you guys get a lot of props especially from my friends my brother uh for your website being like one of the cleanest, easiest to navigate. Plus it keeps live, you know, inventory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's uh, all Bob. So yeah, Bob, yeah. great work. <laughs> Definitely go check it out. Definitely go check out the website, plaidroomrecords.com. Yeah, that was like a win. That was like a Bob. Every once in a while he drops like a dime of an idea. Oh yeah. And it was like three years ago. He was like, I think I'm gonna start a website. Just put some stuff on it and see how it goes. I was like, that's stupid. Nobody's going to buy records on our website that they Dude. can get on Amazon. And I was totally wrong. Um, out of the pandemic, you guys also birthed uh, Brighter Days Ahead. You know, that was like in April. Once we got into April and we saw all of the projects sort of just crumbling. Yeah. And because the pressing plant was closed and all these other things. And you're just pushing projects and pushing them. And I was like, all right, well, clearly we're not going to be able to stick to our release schedule. And it would seem like a bad idea right. at that point anyways. It seemed sort of like you were firing without the opportunity to, to maximize it. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, it's the whole idea of digital releases every week and putting the band camp money to the band, um, sort of satisfies fans, hopefully puts a little bit of money in the artist's pocket and um, keeps it moving. So it's called Brighter Days Ahead and what they do is they have a live chat room. They premiere it live on youtube the new song maybe it's a maybe it's two new songs sometimes sure. or yeah. a video which is great and uh these guys are in the chat room a lot of the other artists from the label show up in the chat yeah. room and it's support. pretty fun it's it super, is super fun. fun it adds like a sense of community and i was telling somebody i really like it because it feels like back in when i worked at a c store back in the 90s there was like anticipation yeah you know and it, that's kind of gone right you know now with with spotify and everything like yeah. you can hear it whenever you want right there's no wait whereas i remember opening the c store on monday night at midnight for like a new radio head record and right. everybody would come out at midnight to go buy it and we would listen to it at midnight and that was so fun yeah and so i kind of it feels i get that same sort of feeling when we like announce or you know post those songs at 10 because people are hearing them for the first time usually yeah that's fun and you're getting all those reactions it's the same type of this thing this sucks <laughs> yeah. god Dude, i can't believe i some... stayed up till 10 for this <laughs> it's a very real thing by like one person every week it just seems Dude, like some asshole just somebody hates stumbles me. upon I did, it i did something very bad to someone <laughs> at some point probably a student they were just like that guy was a dick I Tony hate. used to be a biology teacher, everybody, a high school biology teacher. Yep. So he has great facts about how different animals procreate. That's a, that was like a, that was going to be a 
pandemic idea. <laughs> every every Wednesday, I was gonna put like a twenty minute lecture up of different phyla. That's how great. Create like well, we'll have the time now, so let's have these hump day Wednesdays. Yeah, biology was great, man. I actually really enjoyed that class as a kid. I sucked at every well. I was good at physics. I sucked at earth science and. Uh, chemistry were my two terrible sciences yeah. i was good biology was just interesting to me and then uh physics is mostly math and i have a mathematical brain there so. you go well yeah. i had i've taught zoology so and there's no state standards for that okay so literally <laughs> i'm just goes. like cool we're gonna do a month on sharks you know why <laughs> sharks are dope <laughs> hey guess what i think you should know all these man, <laughs> that stuff is so much more useful i feel like as you become an adult just to have that weird random knowledge of oh, just what's around you and you can impress your friends or your family and be like yeah that's a and, and know. kids and kids in middle town blue jay <laughs> for real and, and kids in middle town that as soon as we got to like identification stuff because all my all my like education professors would you know kind of kibosh that like is like right. low level you know it's not higher level thinking i'm like listen i'm just trying not to get killed by the kid and just keep their attention for 50 minutes at a time like right. and when you teach them how to identify stuff whether it's birds or fish or amphibians or whatever that's like stuff they can go it's do. tangible yeah. yeah they they'll be like yo mr cole i went home i saw i saw a morning dove it was outside of my house <laughs> i heard it and then, and then we did, and I taught botany, same thing. Like kids, it, like, it sounds boring, but kids be like, Mr. Cole, I got six silver maples outside of my house. <laughs> Are you telling me that the developer of my neighborhood was cheap? And I'm like, yes, they were cheap. I'm so sorry. <laughs> if you lived in a nice neighborhood, they would have got sugar maples. How old were you when you, when you were uh, a teacher? Like 22. Like what was the range? 20, uh, how old were the kids? When, no, no, no. When you started. Uh, like to, 22 to 29 yeah 30. so that's like the perfect age to like still be super chill and not jaded yet and yeah yeah, yeah and I, I really wasn't i mean i had the i had a, i had a cake gig i oh, painted yeah. myself when i got there i had one zoology class and as soon as i went to that first year i realized this class is amazing yeah how do i just get this all day and so i told all my biology kids like yo sign up for zo and they'll have to make more sections of zo. <laughs> and so by my third year, I was doing six zo, and I wasn't doing any bios. There's no state tests. Wow. I'm doing whatever I want all day. Like I painted myself into. You're a like a gym teacher, but in a classroom. For real. And it was like, <laughs> you know what we're doing today? We're gonna go outside. Right. We're gonna identify every bird that you see. So we'll get back into it, but before we take a break, uh, any big things on the horizon with the record label or the shop? You know, any inside um, scoop? Yeah, I mean, so we got Record Store Day, the shop, Record Store Day Part 2, and then Part 3 in October, and then Black Friday in November. Um, but the label side, uh, Ghost Funk Orchestra okay. has another record in November, which nice. is amazing. Has that been announced? No. So this is the first time you're hearing it. Exclusive. Exclusive. Uh, and then Kelly Finnegan, which he's teased it a lot. Kelly has a Christmas record that'll oh, yeah. be out. For yeah, Black he's been Friday. teasing that since last Christmas, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> we had it like halfway done, and then uh, he had to get the monophonics record done, mm -hmm. and we just didn't get around to it. But that monophonics album, everybody, by the way, is if it's not one A on everyone's charts at the end of the year, it's one B. <laughs> All it's right. so good. It is. It's, 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 it's amazing. It's amazing. And his Christmas record is like... What's your favorite song on that album, by the way? Uh, it's Only Us? That's your favorite song? No, wait. On that album? Yeah, album. on that album. Uh, I'm going Tunnel Vision. Yeah, I like Tunnel Vision. I think I like Suffocating. That's, uh, that's yeah, very that, close that's to me. That's the one that's got the slide guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, like, I, like, I think they have their own like brand of... You know, like Kelly, like soul. Yeah, like Kelly. There's some stuff that like connects with the Sweet Soul crew yep. on there, but it's not straight. Like that, the Sweet Soul cr scene is getting so saturated. Yeah, um, maybe just because I'm in it, but it's like I feel <laughs> like every other day there's like a new band doing like a slow sure. six eight sweet tune, and I feel like their stuff is just sort of just different. So anyway, we'll take a quick break. Oh, wait, Rudy DeAnda, though, has a new album coming, too. Oh, we should yeah. plug out that this, real quick. Out this Friday. Yep, out this Friday. It's fantastic. So and Rudy is, like, the sweetest dude that you'll you'll ever meet. If you're, like, uh, 
Chicano Batman vibes. Yeah. If you like that, you'll definitely like Rudy. Is half the album in Spanish and half the album in English? Oh, uh, yeah, it's, it's about half. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. So I looked Bardo's, at the track titles. And, and Bardo um, from Chicano Batman is on a bunch of the records. Oh, really? So, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. It's great. Yeah, I'm it's excited. It's one of my favorite excited. album covers we've done. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. It just came, it came out like... I don't know. Just fits the record. Uh, Terry, we're going to ask some of the weird, random, fun questions now. Do it. If Coal Mine Records was interpreted as a style of beer, what style would it be? Um, I think it would be some sort of stout. Stout, all right. Yeah. Not because that's what I like necessarily, but yeah. that just feels like... Rich. Yeah. Rich and deep. Thick with it. Thick um, with it. Ironically, when I first started here, before I even got the job... They let me name a beer mm -hmm. and then do the artwork for it. And it was a stout. They were like, the beer is a stout. Make a name for it. And I was like, how about Round a Stout Midnight? Like a Miles Davis play. Yeah, yeah, that's and good. that's where that illustration that's around the corner that's, came from and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I was feeling that like jazzy. Like, yeah. You, know? you guys had a short collaboration with uh, Jackie O's as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That went pretty well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We did that uh, like oak barrel aged peanut butter stout get you drunk instantly yeah like 13 we were like we were like this close to doing a, a rattler oh man to, uh, us dude with uh with, we'll kelly, with like uh with kelly fin like a kelly finnegan tie i, I love that was i thought that was great oh it was great a rattler with like an orange peel <laughs> yeah, yeah, for, yeah like i think it was orange and lime yeah it was an orange irish lime rattler it was an, an too irish easy kelly finnegan slam tie dunk in. we'll still do it we need to still do that yeah, he'll still yeah. he'll make another record exactly We'll do a Christmas version of it. <laughs> uh, if Karma Chief, though, was... What would Karma Chief be a uh, style of beer? Uh, I, th I think Karma Chief would be like an IPA, like a really gnarly So IPA. explain the difference real quick for the viewers watching, what the difference in your mind is between that's Karma where it, Chief and... That's, where it ex that's the only place it exists <laughs> is in my mind. So Coal Mine is, um, I feel like, such a corporation yeah. flagship... Uh, no, it's like, you know, Coal Mine's the first label. We right. started doing it with Coal Mine. It was strictly sold R&B, funk, jazz, Latin, Afro. But then eventually we were, we, you know, had the opportunity or wanted to work with artists that didn't fit in that range. And so we could either go one of two ways. We could either broaden Coal Mine's approach, which a lot of people sh say that's what we should have done. Mm -hmm. Or we could just have a separate brand that would catch those sure things and so that's what karma chief is. so where who was the first on karma chief so black pumas were the first really uh, they, they were karma chief okay i yeah, guess we, i didn't realize that we signed them to karma chief for that record and then i thought they were coal mine yeah i didn't realize they were karma chief well no they because that that stuff felt uh distinctly contemporary to yeah. me um in more like alabama shakes sort of yeah. space and so i was like and, and to me that felt like a really good one to ride out on Sure. Like this is and not obviously that it turned different, out to be, right? It I did. know. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're not the but it, <laughs> 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 Take a sip. <laughs> We're early in the Karma Chief years, right? So there's definitely there's some people that are like, oh yeah, so that's your psych label. I'm like, ah, no, not really. It's like, but yeah. it does tend to like there is a lot. Yeah, in that you space. got ghost funk kind of fits that that vibe. Yeah, yeah. Rudy's like got a lean in that direction. Right. Um, but Neil, Neil kind of Neil yeah, could go like you could make an argument that Neil, Neil could go and soul go either and way. Funk, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. But I think I don't know. It it literally probably just exists in my mind. Yeah, it's it's and then reminds the reissue label. Oh, yeah, but exactly. uh, but I think Karma Chief is just it's fun because there you know we can do whatever. And it was definitely informed by the store, you know, right? Because because as we were running the store and we started to see thing other bands that were successful that we liked, obviously. And we're like, man, that'd be fun to work with a band that's like this. Right. You know, and Coal Mine sort of felt like we were we were in this narrow lane. Um, so, yeah, Karma Chief was like, a, it's a catch-all. All right, so here's the next weird question. Hit Let's me. take four roles in a brewery, right? You got a head brewer, you got a taproom manager, a marketing director, and a CEO. You're going to take four artists who are on Coal Mine or Karma Chief and fill those roles Hypothetically, what are you doing? I think um, head brewer, oh, let me start with marketing director. I think marketing director uh, could be ghost funk because Seth is like a, 
he's just a creative a creative freak. Yeah. Ooh, he might have to share that role with Kendra Morris. I think they could both they could both tag team that. Tapper manager, he could be shakedown. Cause those dudes are all pretty type A. Yeah. In a way. <laughs> but they're all really good. But are um, they friendly too? Yeah. You gotta be friendly as Tapper. Yeah, no, they're they're all like they, okay. they have a, a pretty broad, broad skill set. Head brewer. So who's in the back cooking up the hits that doesn't this person's not talking to anybody, right? Yeah, no. No one in the front of the house is hearing from the brewer. <laughs> unless they do like a private tour or something like that. I don't know. Kelly would be a good head brewer, but he's pretty personable too. Yeah. But he's good at I mean, but he's, he's good he's, at cooking up the match. Yeah, yeah. He can cook up the the goods and then CEO. I mean Leroy Conroy obviously would have to be the CEO. <laughs> Duh. That's him. <laughs> <laughs> well, he would he would have to be the CEO. There's just no way around it. Uh, so, what's an inner coal mine collaboration that hasn't yet happened that you'd love to see in the future? Meaning, two artists or two bands come together from coal mine or Karma Chief that have not collaborated yet. I would love to see um, the the Monophonics or Andrew Kelly do something with Duran and the guys. Oh yeah, I think it'd be sick. I, I don't know what it would sound like, but. But that's have, the reason you'd want to see it because yeah, they're both yeah, yeah. so talented. We but. have we have something close on Kelly's Christmas record. Aaron's on there. Okay, um, and it's great. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's yeah. really cool because they they have very different voices. You know, right? Aaron and um, Grand or Aaron and Kelly. Uh, Aaron and Kelly. Well, all three of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I, I think there's all kinds. I'd also like to hear like Delvon with like singer with a singer, singer on top. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Um, That'd be but wild. but also with instrumental stuff, I always think like it could be. Sometimes instrumental bands have this tendency to think like all they need is a singer, and then they'll sure. then they'll be whatever. Right. And it's like sometimes no, like it's like uh, sometimes it's like the worst cr- thing. Crumbins like, getting there. Yeah, like they've they're creeping. They're creeping, but they they're on another. They can oh, they can they do, can do it, whatever you know, how they want. I feel like they can. Sure, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that album's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> they might have a 45 on Karma Chief coming up. You, who? I, I don't know. If we, we didn't hear that. It was, in his, it was in his glass. But, uh, they some, might. I don't know. Man, who knows? Possibly. Uh, name one coal mine act that you would think would thrive in the 1960s. Mm. And one Motown act that you would have loved to discover in 2020 and sign to coal mine. So you're discovering an act that's signed to Motown for the first time, and it's 2020. Stevie Wonder. All right. That's um, it's almost a no-brainer. Duh. Um, you could have gone Marvin Gaye or something like that, yeah, though, too. You know, right. Either one. Oh, I'd say Stevie or Marvin Gaye. Okay, sure. Stevie. Stevie's um, my guy. Um, but a band that I think would have thrived. I think there's a few. I think Del, and the Del Vaughn is would have been more like on Stacks or something, probably. Sure. But like... Duran and the guys feel like a cool, sweet soul that would have been on a label like that. And then Monophonics feels like, you know, there's plenty of Motown had a, they had a subsidiary that had like more psych soul yeah. and stuff. So I'm that, trying to think it was like that, uh, what was the band? It was like mostly just all white dudes. Um, yeah. Is that um, the band you're thinking of? Because I'm, I'm trying to think of what they were called. Yeah, it's not Vanilla Fudge, but it's like something Earth or, uh, oh, man. So I, I have a rare Earth. Rare Earth. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. See, it's, you looked at me weird. Like, I had no idea what I was talking about. They were a little bit later, but, like, the Four Tops kind of started to get into all that psych soul yeah, sound. Yeah, and Temptations did, too. Right, and so Rare Earth was around that time, like, the early 70s, late 60s, and it just was hard for Motown and to push that sub-label and really get Rare Earth off the ground. When yeah, it's, it's weird when you think about uh, that kind of stuff because it just shows you how we have so many, like we all have predispositions to what is R&B and what is soul. Right. There's this little Richard quote where he's like, what is R&B? R&B is real black. <laughs> and it's like, because when you think about it, when a white person does it, they're like, oh, that's rock. Sure. When a black person does it, like, oh, that's R&B. It's like, these are just generic terms that sure. we've just all it's assigned. Genre. Like, right. oh yeah, white, black over here right. and it's so it's so arbitrary i mean Absolutely. it's so like even when you look at contemporary r&b like you listen to contemporary stuff and you're like what makes this more or less of this category other than 
the color of this person's skin. And dude, people are stretching genres so far these days 100%. And, and exploring different stuff. Yeah. Um, you can, I mean, it happened, it's been happening since, since those days yeah, where people yeah. are like surprised when they realize that it's a man or a woman or it's, uh, it's this race or this race, you yeah. know, it's like, there's so, it, 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 the stretch is just wild. And, yeah. And, but those categories, it's like, it's so arbitrary. Yeah. It's like we st everybody falls back to it. Cause you, at the end of the day, you got to put a category on something, right? Right. You got to put a tag on it. You got to have something like what genre is it? I, I love thinking about that and trying to figure out. Cause what I mean, it's like, it's like in the fifties, it was the same thing. They called it race music. It was like, you know, King records down in Cincinnati was doing, they had two different, they had blue labels for black folks and they had red labels. They had their hillbilly, hillbilly. Really? Re yeah. The red labels were hillbilly records <laughs> and the Fucking blue hell. labels were, was race music. Yeah. And if you didn't know what color the folks were, you just knew by the label. You, well, you, you wouldn't even you. Some of it you would you'd be like, oh, this is blues or this is sure. wh whatever. But it was distinguished by that, you know. And it, a lot of the music was Unreal. the same thing, you know. Right. It was the same kind same, of music, exactly. Um, anyway, that's fascinating, though. I mean, just just the history of music and how those how styles how, genre styles have gotten their names and the how they just hang. They yeah, just, exactly. They just and, hang around, right? <laughs> It's almost not a good thing. It's not. <laughs> but it's it's what's interesting to me is that you guys seem to stretch like like you'll you'll stretch like three genres within one. You'll be like sunk psych funk soul. Like it's yeah. like a it's like a hyphenated thing just to like yeah, try to get three things. Oh yeah, one. funky soul organ jazz. <laughs> yeah. Well it's got an organ. It's pretty funky. <laughs> it's kind of jazzy, but it's soulful. What? And hey, uh, it's <laughs> instrumental. <laughs> uh <laughs> All right, so next weird question. You're stuck in a house in the woods for one year with one coal mine act. All right, and you all have, all you have to do for fun is record music. But you're also stuck in the house with them for a year. So who's it going to be? Who are yeah. you picking to be stuck in a house for a year? You got uh, plenty of bathrooms, so if it's Ghost Funk Orchestra and there's 20, 30 freaking people, you're, you're fine on the bathrooms. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to it. Uh, you could be Shakedown again. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're a broad bunch. Got a lot of different talents. Between them, we can probably cover 50 instruments. Yeah. And they're, none of them I don't think are, are too wild. They're all pretty mellow. I feel like we could easily get along <laughs> and not kill each other. There's um, what, nine, eight, nine? It's like eight or nine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, next question. You're invited to karaoke deathmatch where you must perform one song and nail 90% of the lyrics in order to survive. What song are you singing? I, I think, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. Really? I think so. I think you I could nail actually, like you know a lot the of weird music parts where it's just real fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, no. A lot of music, I don't listen to lyrics. <laughs> I'm like <laughs> they're kind of like flying by, and I'm like, oh yeah, sick. But that is a thing with soul music, though. For the most, like, I feel like like soul music is lyrical, but it's oftentimes simple. It, like it some is. of the best stuff is the simple stuff. Yeah, and and it definitely hangs with you. Um, I could probably do some Marvin Gaye songs too, but I think I could. I spent enough time in high school with uh, performing that song at around the lunch table that I think if my life depended on it, I think I would go with Bohemian Rhapsody. What's like the best known rap song that you know the lyrics to? Just out of curiosity for uh, myself. Probably something from uh, De La Soul, The Grind Date. The Grind Date? Of yeah. All De La I Soul think, albums. I, I think like I know. Rock that. Cocaine Flow, that Ooh, yeah, yeah. That's the I best think, song on I, the I, album. I think, I think that one or uh, what's the one that has much more? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think I'd know the Rock Cocaine, the rock cocaine Flow or much more. I just I just burnt that record, or or maybe Common B, something okay. from B. Next question: What's one band that your brother loves that you hate? Mm, I don't even hate them. I just love to hate them because I know how much he likes them. Um, so Bob loves Towns Van Zant. Okay. I love Towns Van Zant too. <laughs> But I don't like to tell Bob that I like Towns Van Zandt. So this is the I first know. time that Bob is hearing that you actually oh, like Oh, he knows. Townsend. Anytime I come down and he's listening to Towns Van Zandt or any, like, sad bastard country shit, <laughs> which I also like, but I'll come down and be like, wow, 
what a vibe. <laughs> Feels great yeah. in here. What is this right. about alcoholism and killing yourself? Right, right. Sick. Um, <laughs> this is what people want to hear. If you could get one more album from any artist, dead or alive, and it be their best work yet, who would it be? People that are dead. I think another Amy record. Like another Amy Winehouse, Winehouse track would yeah. be amazing if it had to be, but it would have to be produced by Mark Ronson, and Gabe Adaptone. Um, another Sam Cooke record. Another uh, Donny Hathaway record. Donny Hathaway. I think Donny Hathaway might be might be one that that comes to mind. That's kind of where I lean. Not of the three that you said for sure, because I I think of Otis Redding. Oh, yeah, Quite a that's bit. probably, yeah. And I say, man, that dude, like, how old is he? 27, 28? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 26, yeah. maybe even? He just yeah. looked way older than he was. But, like, <laughs> he, did. he put out a lot of content in the short time that he was For making sure. music. sure, tons of records. But, yeah. you know, this is best year. But it doesn't feel like there was any, like, artistic. <laughs> exactly. He, he, didn't, he didn't get old enough to uh, have expand a what's going on. Into, or, yeah. Yeah. I feel like he was getting pushed in a direction. He could have gone the Stevie Wonder route and literally just, like, said, I have enough control and enough of a voice that I have say in, in this matter. Yeah, because you look you look at those guys, you know, Marvin and Stevie, you know, they made they made similar records to yeah. Otis as far as like pop B soul, you know, like and then they took a turn yeah. and made some of the greatest records ever made. Oh, I know, man. Stevie just once kept reinventing. Control. Yeah. It's unfortunate that like once he got to like eighty eight, he just kind of stopped. If you could book any three bands, dead or alive, on the fretboard stage for one awesome night, who would you book? Uh, JB from like 68. Okay. 67. Um, the higher players. Wait, wait, wait. So 68, 67, that era? Yeah. That was, was that Bootsy that's, era? That's pre JB, or that's pre Bootsy. Yeah, okay. That's what I thought. Okay. Yeah. Bootsy um, was early 70s, right? Um, the Ohio players. From like '69, and uh, Lee Moses from '69. Man, yeah, heavy. That's yeah. a crazy night. Be a heavy. Lineup. You really curated that <laughs> night too. Like, <laughs> who starts? Who starts that show? Who ends it? Oh, uh, let's see. I guess if we were like in 1969, it'd probably be like Lee Moses, Ohio. And if we're in Cincinnati, it'd be yeah. like Lee Moses, Ohio players, JB. Right. I think. But that makes sense. I guess there was a, I read an interview or something from James Brown's book, one of his books, and it was talking about how he played in, in Atlanta with Lee Moses opening. And when he got off stage, he was like, man, great set. You're never, I'm never going to play with you again. <laughs> <laughs> just because I think Lee Moses just like torched the place. Yeah, yeah. You know, just like burn it down. Right. Um, but yeah, I think those those three would just... That's that would, fascinating. That would, I was not expect. I mean, I don't know what I was expecting to be honest with you, but I thought your taste would have gone a whole different direction. I didn't realize you were so like funk driven. I think those, with like JB and the Ohio I mean, players JB, and like JB is like well Ohio players from '69. Were they a little bit more? I don't. I, yeah, Ohio players from '69. I only really know them like, as their no. So Ohio players from '69 is like is it's like Midwest R and B like crossover okay. soul R and B like. Curtis sort of yeah, vibes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Not, not, oh, well, look, none of that. <laughs> like, none of that. None of that. I, I don't listen to a single record after the first one. Right, right. Talk about purists. That's why I'm a purist. Yeah. The first That's one, everything else is dead to me. Like, <laughs> oh, I don't. So you're just, you're getting them for like a Literally 45 just minute that. set to just, play that one album that they Just put that. <laughs> after that, I could take it or leave it. Like, it doesn't, I, 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 that record, I, I found out about that record. Um, I was at a flea market in Monroe and um, this guy had his trunk open with selling records. And I was like, he, he was like, oh, what are you looking for? I was like, oh, I'm really into like, you know, deep funk and heavy soul. I was, I think I was 16 or something, 17. And he was like, oh, do you know about this? And he pulled out the first Ohio Players record, Observations in Time from 69. It's got this snarly sight cover. I'm like, nah, man, that shit's kind of corny to me. Like, I don't really like Ohio Players, you know, all that shit's just corny to me. And he's like, no, 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 you never listened to this record, have you then? And I was like, well, no. And that dude was right. Like, that, <laughs> but he, I went home and I was like, my God, this record is just blowing my mind. That's like, pretty it's epic. So, it's just like, it's like, um, I don't even know what to compare it to. It's like just heavy, 
funk, like deep, heavy shit. Yeah. And it's not anything like anything after that. that like, that's like the only, it's like the only uh, one. What's that Maybe album? Isaac Hayes. What's Observations in Time. Okay. All right. This is the last question. This is totally unrelated to a lot of other stuff. But Terry, if your brother Bob were to release a slam poetry album, right? And he's, it's about computer engineering because that's his background. Such exciting, invigorating <laughs> stuff. What would it be called, and what would the hype sticker say? Oh, man. I think so, the, the name of the album would just be, like, ten zeros and ones. <laughs> Duh. Um, and then the hype sticker would say... Wait. It would say, I think, uh, let's see. <laughs> so, F- funky. I'll, this will give you a minute, because for anybody who is unaware, Terry designs... Almost everything between him and his wife Whitney, she does the photography. Terry does the design for a lot of covers for all the coal mine. Well, yeah, almost, almost all, almost of, all them. of them. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Coal mine vinyl record releases, and so he has to make the little stickers that go on the shrink wrap that say, you know, and I've this really, punk psych <laughs> album is fucking amazing. Buy it. You know, like that's him. And it started. It started as like in the beginning, it was easy because nobody, you know. You want the hype sticker not to be ambiguous. You want the hype sticker to be like, this is what this is. Exactly, right. Because you're trying to get the least, trying to get somebody who has no idea to like take an interest. And so if you have this really artsy description of it, people are like, yeah, okay. Right. Like, whatever. You know, <laughs> comparable to the Beatles. Like, nah, probably right. not. You're not going to sell me on that. <laughs> but if it's like, this sounds like this. Yeah. You know, and you make it really specific. So, but yeah, but now it's really hard coming up with now. I've I've run through all of my exaggeratory. So in the old days, hyperbole and exactly. But so like a separate of hyperbole, when you're writing one of these for Bob's, uh, you know, awesome slam poetry about computer engineering. Yeah. yeah how yeah. direct is it going to be? Is it going to be like slow? It's got to be and boring. It's got just... <laughs> honest. <laughs> Honest, passionate, and unemotional <laughs> coding that will help you in your everyday life. Yes. We love you, Bob. Sorry you couldn't be here, bud. Honest and unemotional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honest and unemotional. From M- Midwest, Ohio, <laughs> unemotional coding that will help you with your everyday life. From a guy who runs a record <laughs> store but could have been a computer engineer. Oh, he was for like, you know, two months. Three yeah, months. and he still kind of is because he manages the website. So there's some engineering I mean, going on there. Yeah, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have software because there's no <laughs> way we were going to pay for software. He spent, I don't know how many months in our his old, our, our parents' bedroom before he moved to Loveland coding all of that software. And wow. every, every day after school, I would like drive by and be like, how's it going, dude? <laughs> oh, you should change that. <laughs> Ooh, nah. I'd just be like that guy that right, would just right. come in after like 12 hours worth of work and be like, I don't know. <laughs> and now he does that to me. Like, I'll be like, bro, look at this artwork. He's like, mm. <laughs> uh, too blue. Too blue. It's, it's a little too blue. <laughs> I don't get it. Well, Terry, we'll wrap this episode up. Please keep going to Plaid Room Records in Loveland. Thank it's you. A fantastic spot. It's my personal favorite record store. Uh, quite the discovery for myself, you know, a year ago, and and now I can't see myself really going anywhere else, even if it's further out than all the other places for me. I live right around the corner from everybody's, but I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to Plaid Room. And if you haven't uh, checked out on Spotify, there's a playlist that'll introduce you to Coal Mines called yep. "This Is Coal Mine Records." It'll, it's all up to date, right? It's everybody's, it's yeah, every yeah, yeah. song pretty much that's available um, on Spotify. It's, it's, it's like at least one, one to three of each artist usually. Okay. We kind of, at this point, we're just kind of adding as things are released. Right. So, yeah, it's a good... It's a good, great starting launching point for a lot of music from the record label uh, between Karma Chief, Remind, and Coal Mine. Yep, yeah, for um, sure. That's kind of how I fell into the rabbit hole, and here's where we are. So, right. Yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely, Appreciate man. it. Really appreciate it. We'll, we'll, I'll probably be by this weekend, if not uh, next week, to pick up that we'll Ruby be there. album. We'll I be still there. have a gift card that I need to be <laughs> used. So, <laughs> everybody, thank you so much for watching. We will uh, be back next week with Branch and Bone. We're doing a collaboration with them, and uh, we're going to have Branch and Bone up in Dayton 
uh, sitting down with us to do an interview with Kevin Moreland, our uh, production manager. Cool. So, yeah, man. Terry, thanks so much. Yeah, thank Bye, you. Bye, everybody.